Hello, here we're in the multiple linear regression setting and we're going to look at what's called variance proportions. And it really deals with helping us detect multicollinearity in the multiple linear regression model. So here we assume that our model is y is equal to x beta plus epsilon. Now beta is a k plus 1 by 1 vector of constants. Um, we will scale the design matrix. Oh, here comes my cat. <laughs> um, we will scale the design matrix, but not center it. And so I, he really is going, to, she is really going to let me not do this. So I'll hold her while we do it. Um, so I have a video called uh, Centering and Scaling. That is uh, video number 39 in my playlist. Um, if you want more on what I mean by not centered. But we are going to scale it. And that means take each column in our design matrix and divide by the length of that column. And so this is the standard, uh, inner, uh, we're going to use the standard inner product as our, our uh, you know, how we measure length. And so it's the squared length is just the sum of each of the components. So a little background first. Let's let lambda i be the uh, eigenvalues of x transpose x and vi be the associated uh, orthonormal eigenvector associated with that lambda corresponding to this matrix. Now since x transpose x is symmetric and positive definite, all the lambda i's are real and positive, every one of them. The spectral decomposition um, of x transpose x can be, and I have a video called the Spectral Decomposition Theorem. It We can represent it as P lambda P prime, where P is the matrix of our orthonormal eigenvectors. Lambda is a diagonal element of the eigenvalues, and of course P is orthogonal. Um, X transpose X can be thought of as, as this. So if we take the inverse of X transpose X, it's the inverse of this. And now each one of those are square, you know, invertible matrices. So we distribute the, the inverse sign. Now the inverse of an orthogonal matrix transpose is just the original matrix. Uh, inverse of P is going to be P transpose. That's just the kind of the definition of orthogonal matrices. And the inverse of this diagonal matrix is really, it's, a, it's an, again a diagonal matrix, but the, the diagonal matrix of the original matrix is inverted. So it's one over lambda zero, one over lambda one, all the way down. Now the trace of the, this inverse, so the trace of this, is the trace of this, now the trace is a nice property. You can move these matrices around. So it becomes a trace of this, but this is the identity matrix. So it's really the trace of this, but the trace of a diagonal matrix is just the, the sum of the diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix is this, so it's just the sum. Okay, so th that's background. Now, one thing that we want, and if we think about this, we want the least squares estimates of beta, call it beta hat, to be as close as possible as to the as to beta, right? That's kind of one of those duh, you know, that of course we do. So the difference in our estimate and the true population parameters, we want pretty close to zero, right? So if this vector is pretty close to zero, that means its squared length is actually pretty close to zero, right? So this vector product is the length of this vector, which is close to zero. So the length is close to zero, right? So, well, let's examine the, this, the, the squared length of this vector. And if we take the expected value of it, then we were finding the average squared length of this vector, right? And we really want this close to zero. That's, I mean, that would be perfect. So the expected value of this squared length, now this vector product is this, right? So we take the first component, first component, second component, second component, you know, multiplied together and then add it up. So that's what this is. Now since expected value is a linear operator, we can take it in. 
But this right here is we're taking a random variable minus its mean squared. So this really is the variance of beta i hat. So the sum of those. So this average squared length is the sum of the variances of our beta i components, our least squares estimates. Okay. So from uh, previous video 22 in my playlist, the variance of beta hat is equal to this. It's the sigma squared uh, x transpose x inverse. So the uh, the 22 in this playlist playlist is general general linear models regression. And then look at the 22nd video deals with least squares estimates. Okay, so it's the variance is this. Now notice that this is a matrix. So this is the variance covariance matrix. And so if we want the variance of beta one hat, we look at the first diagonal. If we want the ith estimate of this, we look at the i ith diagonal of this, and that's the variance of the beta i hat, right? So, this expected squared length, which we said was this, but th th each variance is actually the diagonal elements of this, so the sum of every variance is actually the trace of this L, this vector, I mean this matrix, which is this, right? Sigma squared comes out because it's constant. But the, the trace of this matrix is the sum of 1 over the eigenvalues. So then we multiply the, that sigma squared in, and this is it. So this is the average squared length of this vector, beta hat minus beta. So now, let's do some further manipulation and notes. So the inverse of this, remember we just took the trace of this, but let's see if, let's develop some notation here. So this was, was we said was this, P lambda inverse P prime. And P was a matrix of the orthonormal eigenvectors. Lambda inverse was one over the you know, the reciprocal of the lambdas. And again, this is just the, the transpose of this. Now I'm going to write this out in a little more detail just so we can do it. So here the first, you know, you know V0 has, has K plus 1 component. So V00, V10, V all the way to VK0. So the first index is kind of like the row and the second index is, is like the column. So it's all zeros corresponding to V0. Now V1 is here and all the way to VK. Now this again is just a diagonal matrix. And this one, remember it's a transpose. So we take this column and make it the row. We transpose it. And so that's what this represents. Now let's multiply this out. And it, and so we take this first row times this first column and we get this. Then we, then we take the first row times the second column and we get this. And then we repeat all the way down. This, you know, this becomes this. Okay. Now I didn't rewrite that, I just wrote what it was. It's a transpose. But now when we take this product and think about putting this matrix right here, right? So it's this row times this column, and we get this. This row times the second column, we get this. This row times the, you know, k plus one column, or, you know, vk, we get this. And then we repeat, and we get this matrix here, okay? And I only wrote out a few of them, because really, on the previous page, we looked at the trace of this, so we really only want the diagonal elements. Okay, so let's look at the variance of B beta zero hat. Now it on the it, it's this, so it's sigma squared times the first diagonal element, which is this, right? We're and traditionally we've called it C one one. 
Now, if we look at the beta K, so the, the variance of, of beta K hat is actually the K plus one diagonal, which is the last one. So we stick the, you know, and so it's sigma squared times this, which is this, and that's CKK. And we could actually do that for the, the ith component. So we, we, the beta I hat is the, it's actually the I plus one column. Or, you know, or this. So I take this sum and expand it and put it here. Okay. We call that CII. Now here's the first note. Each eigenvalue contributes to each variance, right? Each eigenvalue is associated with the variance of beta not hat. Same way with beta K. Even the, the, I, the variance of the ith beta hat. It, you know, every eigenvalue is associated with this. Okay, CII. So now, let's, and, and actually this partitions the variance of, of beta I hat, which is kind of interesting in itself. So now, if we take the total variance of beta I hat and, and, and divide it, take this divided by CII, and then we look at each component, right? Now, the, the sigma squareds cancel right and then we have this divided by the the total variance and actually that's what we call the variance components the variance proportions I mean so we take this divided by its total this divided by its total all the way and so each one of these represents a proportion of the total variance associated with bi hat that's what this represents Right? So really, remember, if you multiply that in and then divide by CII, which is the whole thing, this sigma squared will cancel with the sigma squared in this. And then we're just left with this piece, which is the, this, divided by the, the total, which is that. And then this piece divided by the total. So we get a proportion. So it really, it's the proportion of the variance associated with an eigenvalue, okay. So this, uh, so this PJI is the proportion of the variance of beta i hat, which is due to the, you know, to the jth uh, eigenvalue. You know, we don't know which eigenvalue is going to make it large. Now, and actually, I think this seen in an example or a table help illustrates it so much better. Now, I don't have an example here, but I'm going to write out what's called a collinearity diagnostic table, which I think will help with that, okay? So first, um, it, the first part of the collinearity diagnostic table would be this, where we look at the variance inflation factors. So each parameter, so the intercepts associated with beta zero, the first regressor associated with beta one, beta two, etc. Now the parameter estimates are the least squares estimates, parameter of the respective beta parameters. Now there's an estimated standard error associated with each of these beta parameters. Now the variance inflation factor, and we're using what's called a centered variance inflation factor, um, is the variance of beta 1, the increase in variance of beta 1 over the ideal case. So that's the variance inflation factor of beta 1, beta 2. And if these are big, it says that multicollinearity may exist and the variance um, associated with that beta parameter is inflated by multicollinearity in the model. So that's what these VIFs, or the variance inflation factors, tell us. Now let's look at the condition number. The condition number was the maximum eigenvalue associated with X transpose X divided by, say, the minimum. Or you can, can do a condition number for each eigenvalue. So you take the, you find the maximum and then divide it by uh, lambda zero and that's the condition number for um, uh, lambda zero. And you do that lambda one, to, uh, the maximum eigenvalue divided by lambda one is this condition number. Now, one of these is gonna be one, right? Because one of them is the maximum and you divide by that eigenvalue, which is the maximum, is 1. But some of these may be 
quite large because if we have multicollinearity, one of these is going to be really small. You take the maximum divided by, that's going to be large. That tells us that there's uh, multicollinearity in the des uh, design matrix. You know. Now these are the variance proportions. Okay, so the, the these are the beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat, beta k hat. Now the variance of beta zero is is kind of is the is is almost it's like the sum of this, right? But since we divided by the total variance of this, and 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 um, then we get a proportion. So actually, so if we add these columns. It adds to one, and so maybe we say that. Each column sums to one, so this sums to one, because this is the proportion of the variance of beta one hat associated with this eigenvalue. So each one of these has a proportion of the variance of beta one hat associated with that respective eigenvalue, okay? And then we do that for each of these. Now, it may turn out that like one of these is you know this proportion may be large because of that you know and, and if that's really small there's probably you know multicollinearity in the design matrix but but how do we find which columns are collinear or nearly collinear and we look at it by row okay so if two or more of the PJIs are large this indicates which variables are collinear and I'll give an example so for example that's eigenvalue 2, if, if P21, P22, and P2K are large, and large means 0.5 or more, and 0.5 is the rule of thumb, it's ish, could be 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, but if two or more of these are large, then it says they're collinear. So if this, so it says the predictor variable 1, predictor variable 2, and predictor variable K may be collinear. The variances associated with the beta parameters are increased by beta or lambda 2, and that's because these may be collinearity, collinear, and that's how you use the variance proportions to detect multicollinearity. Now that's all I'm going to do for multicollinearity in this uh, series, but we're going to revisit it when we talk about or discuss ridge regression and principal components because these are two approaches to help combat multicollinearity in the design matrix. Now they end up giving what's called a biased estimate of the beta parameter, but these are very common approaches to combat multicollinearity. Well, that's all I have. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.